So my slides are usually pretty um, bare bones. I use them more as cues for myself. And the thing I always think about first is that um, I have been, oh, I thought that was my pager. Um, I have been in oncology for uh, about 23 years. And I will admit that I still today was learning about lymphedema, which makes me a little nervous because I work with people all the time who are uh, living with it, who are impacted by it. And the thought that there are still things for me to learn today, just a reminder. And what I often hear from people, um, patients that I work with, most of the patients I work with are living with lymphedema as a secondary diagnosis, not as a primary. Uh, most, again, it's following some sort of treatment for cancer. What they often tell me is that they didn't know about lymphedema, hadn't heard about lymphedema, and didn't realize that they were at risk until the moment that they were diagnosed with it. And part of that, I think, is that uh, we do, even if I know sometimes it's been shared at the, at the moment of discussing possible complications or concerns, but one of the things I think is incredibly important with any illness, chronic or acute, is the way we process information when we are under stress. And uh, this is something that not only do I know from studies, I've lived it myself, that if you go to a stressful doctor's appointment and you're listening to lots of information and you're focusing and you're concentrating so hard and you're taking it all in, you can walk out the door and five minutes later barely remember what you've been told. Often also you misremember. You think very much that you remember exactly what was said to you, but you don't. And again, I really had a friend once test me. She, she challenged me because I thought I could do it. Um, and I, I did terribly. So the other piece, which uh, for me was true, is that I think when we first hear about things, we make our own associations. Wherever we go in our own head, often I think we look for explanations. Uh, we look for what we did to cause something. Uh, we immediately start thinking about what could we have done to prevent something and start worrying so far ahead when we might need to just focus on what the immediate next step is. Once you've grasped, let's say, what the diagnosis is for yourself, I think then the next step is how you explain it to other people. And the things that I often hear from people, the number one is saying it's not a side effect. Uh, the other thing I hear, which I didn't put in the slide, um, but it's, I often hear people say to me that it's upsetting to them that they are told by a close loved one, um, well, you know, I know you have lymphedema, but you're so lucky it's not worse. Or just, it could have been the cancer being worse, but not. And what we talk about often, uh, there's a breast cancer group I lead out in Needham, and this comes up a lot, is what people feel is, yes, I am lucky that uh, my cancer is under control and that it's just lymphedema but I don't feel lucky to have lymphedema. And that's a really important distinction. I mean, luck is, I'm gonna talk about this little, but luck and all of it, it's all relative. We're not comparing ourselves to the person down the street who has lymphedema and also like their arms fell off. You know, that person has it worse. We're comparing ourselves to us before we had lymphedema. And it's not as good once you've got this thing to deal with. The second thing is that chronic illnesses do not look same one day to the next. So I have lots of people say to me, both about lymphedema and other chronic illnesses, that they will have a day where they're feeling great or they're symptom free. They might be getting together with a friend and that friend is saying, well, you look great. I'm so glad this is behind you. That's so, much, it's so good to be so done with it. You know? And in those moments, nothing is driven home more than the fact that you're not done with it and that two days later you might be dealing with symptoms again and that this person because they're seeing you in this window doesn't understand that this is chronically affecting your life it may even be chronically affecting how comfortable you feel making plans and that's part of what uh, again just looping through the things that people tell me so they say well i'm home i'm not having symptoms i'm feeling fine my friend says do you want to go to this uh, swing dancing class whatever it is, something active. And what's going through their head is, I do want to go, but what if that's a day when I'm having trouble with my symptoms? And, oh, you know, I have to pay in advance, or will my friend be disappointed I have to cancel? So it's always, even when you're not impacted in the moment, I think for most people, it's still impacting the way you feel about being able to approach your life. 
Somewhere along the way. So this is what I think of as um, somewhere along the way, there's a couple of things we might encounter. Um, you may also encounter joy, um, uh, amazement, appreciation, and gratitude. Um, I will say up front, I am one of the things I most love about my job, and I really love my work, is that uh, I get to see the most amazing moments sometimes in people's lives. I see, I see uh, loving families. I see caregivers who are extraordinary. I see patients who are extraordinary. But I also see that there's a tremendous amount of grief, and it's something that we tend to associate with death. But I actually think grief is something that uh, we often feel when we are experiencing the, uh, the loss, or let's say the death, of an image that we had of our own life. Um, the way we might have imagined ourselves, again, the, the person we were before we had this diagnosis, or the, the life that we imagined afterwards. And if, for instance, you are, um, there is a, a woman I work with who's um, a very active, she's always been a marathoner. And for her, this has really been a struggle to lose this vision of herself as someone who, uh, who's just bursting with health and able to run these long distances and no concerns. And there's some grief in that. Uh, it doesn't mean that she will always feel grief about it, but it does mean in that moment when you're changing this vision of yourself, I think you are entitled to have some grief and honor that vision of yourself. Uh, the other thing I think a lot of people run into, which is not probably acknowledged enough, is anxiety and depression. And the reason I always, I, I choose these two and I like to point them out uh, I listed here what I think can lead to some of these things. Uh, for me, the biggest is uncertainty and loss of control. Um, I personally find that very agitating, so I assume other people do, but um, discomfort and pain, of course. Limited range of movement or activity, uh, changes in body image and intimacy. I, I, again, I think it's true that sexuality is not talked about quite enough uh, with regard to any diagnoses, pretty much. and. But certainly with lymphedema, that comes up and it affects how comfortable, how confident you feel, how easily you can move. And who wants to stop in the middle of a really intimate moment and be like, hold on, that hurt. You know, it's, <coughs> it's not good. So anxiety and depression, what I would say is the things to keep in mind, uh, often people say to me, I am very anxious or, well, yeah, I'm probably depressed because I wake up and I cry every day for the first 10 minutes of my day. Um, I'm not exaggerating, by the way. People do experience this and say to me, but it's okay because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust. And I, I understand right now this is circumstantial that I feel so anxious and depressed. And I'll, I'll get used to it and I'll feel better. What I always say to them is I do have a bias about this, which is if you are, my bias is actually that I don't believe in unnecessary suffering. And... Uh, Suffering to me is not just physical pain. It's emotional, it's uh, psychic, it's spiritual pain. And when you're suffering and you're saying to yourself, well, eventually this will get better, um, the truth is it might. It, it really might get better on its own. But in the meantime, I watch people suffer and I wonder if uh, maybe there's more that could be done to help them get out of that. And also, I think when you are depressed or you're feeling anxious, it's much harder to do the things you need to do to help yourself heal and move forward. When you're depressed, it's pretty tempting to just get into bed. Um, if anyone here has ever experienced a what I would think of as a sad depression, you kind of just want to go to bed and like shut the world out. And that makes it hard to do your physical therapy. That makes it hard to eat right because you don't want to get up and make good meals. And, you can also have an agitated depression where you're just pissed off all the time. Um, one person said to me, I hope no one's upset by this, said to me, I, I'm basically fine, but every day I feel like punching my husband, and that's really new for me. And I was like, oh, that's really, we have to talk. So um, that was someone actually who ended up um, using antidepressants for a while, and it got her over a period of time during which her, her fury at this experience, she had recovered wonderfully from breast cancer and then started experiencing lymphedema and was so angry, I think rightly so. She was like, you know, I just, after everything I've been through, um, this doesn't seem fair. And kind of agreed. I mean, it's not. Nobody wants it. Um, 
So the things to take care of yourself, education and information I always put first because I really do think knowledge is power. Um, I will freely admit I went into this field because of a family member having cancer and wanting to uh, feel that I would never have a loss of control or knowledge again, that I would always know everything and I'd be totally in charge. It hasn't worked at all. <laughs> yeah, see, he's, he already knew. Um, but it's true that it does make me feel better all the time, that I, uh, I, can, I feel that I can have access quickly to information and that I know about how to uh, make sure I'm getting good information. And that's really important, by the way. Don't, I always say this to people, don't just start going all over the internet and, and don't go to whatever Facebook group you find. Uh, find the one that somebody else has already told you is, um, is, is pretty well run and, or that somebody's moderating it. Um, I say this partly because you never know. If you join a group and there's nobody overseeing who's in it, you actually have no idea who's posting, if what they're saying is accurate, if they even have lymphedema. Um, I say this as someone who moderates some online groups, and I do sometimes see people with good intention um, posting real misinformation. I mean, so, you know, posting something that's going to scare everyone else in the online room. Uh, it's good to have someone there who can clarify when that happens. So find your good resources. I think today you're, you're getting a lot. Um, psychiatry, counseling, support group, and peer networks. I think of those all as um, sort of a bundle. Hold on, just checking time. Um, how much time do I have? Like four minutes? Oh my God. All right. So, <laughs> so see a psychiatrist. No, uh, psychiatry is um, pretty much if you think you might need meds, that really is what I, I could have done one slide. Um, I, I do, again, even though I'm a social worker, I'm all about like talk therapy. Um, I actually believe a lot in psychiatry. I think sometimes you need medication to help you get to that place where you even have the peace of mind and quiet of mind to talk about what's going on. Counseling, uh, that's more what I do, um, but I also include spiritual counseling in that. I think for a lot of people it's incredibly important to stay connected to their faith community. Um, Support groups and peer groups, I think support groups are wonderful. I, I really do. I love running them, and I love seeing what people get from them. And what I particularly love is that uh, I see a lot of people who come to a group and then continue coming so that they can teach the next uh, generation of people coming in. And that's part of how I think we become our best, uh, our best patients, our best patient self, is by teaching someone else what we've already learned uh, you, you always then have to really push yourself to think about it. Movement and exercise, uh, again, with guidance, but that's important, not just for recovery, but for your mental health. Um, I will say, by the way, I hate exercising, and I'm very aware that when I do, I feel better, and so I make myself do it. Um, I don't hate it, but I, I don't love it. Um, integrative therapies, again, just get guidance. Uh, my rule of thumb, even with things like um, supplements, and, and now with the world of uh, medical marijuana and legal recreational, um, I always say to people, if you think something can help you, then just assume that it also has the power to harm you. So don't do anything without talking to your care team. That's really all that is, is don't add something in. Um, if you're going to go get massage, make sure it's somebody who understands how to massage safely with lymphedema. If you're going to do acupuncture, same thing. Just, just uh, be self-protective. Meditation, uh, God, I'm terrible at it, but everyone tells me it's really, really helpful, and I believe them. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, and this is my last slide. It's the two things I think are most important. Uh, know your strength, right? So start from the place of your strengths. Um, you, do, you don't have all control. You do have some. There are things you can do uh, and that's some of what we've talked about today, to try to take care of yourself. There are things you can do to try to be preventative. And you can be, um, you can be more of a, uh, I always think, I think of it as a take no prisoners approach to life, which is uh, if there are people in your life who are incredibly toxic and every time you're with them, you're like, why? Why do I do this to myself? Stop spending time with them. If there are people that make you feel incredibly uplifted and, and better and going for a walk with them really helps you get a whole new perspective, call them up and ask if they want to take a walk with you. 
do the things that make you feel better. The other piece is uh, you really are the most important member of your own care team. That's sort of the premise of patient-centered care. Nobody knows you as well as you know yourself. I, I can guarantee that. Even if you are the person who 20 times has come in and said, I have a headache, I think it's a brain tumor. There's that, yeah, we've all done it, come on. Um, there's, there's those moments where you say, I have an ache or a pain, and I know that that's, that's normal for a lot of people, but not for me. And that's when you call your doctor. Or if there's some side effect they've told you to watch out for and you think, I'm feeling it, but I kind of don't want to be feeling it and I really want to pretend it's not happening, call your doctor or call your nurse or call your physical therapist, whoever it is, be a squeaky wheel and never be afraid to ask questions, never be afraid to ask for help. And, uh, and I'll certainly say never be afraid to ask for a social worker because, you know, we're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs>